we have a man in our midst who can bring forth truth back beyond doubt. That can open the eyes and ears of those lost in dark. As Saeed Ali Manisa had the man, he is that man. And the author of over 150 books of religious and scientific nature. As Saeed Ali Manisa had the man, he has brought forth this information straight from the scriptures. So it cannot be denied. So we invite you to listen, to learn from the true life featuring As Saeed Ali Manisa had the man. You are now listening to The True Light with Asayid Al Imam Isa Al Hadi Al Mahdi. What kind of influence did John the Baptist have over the people before the coming of Jesus? In Mark 1, they start talking about the baptism. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, they said. As it is written in the prophets, they said, now, this gospel that I'm going to talk to you about is not Jesus' gospel. This gospel is a copy of what the prophets wrote. See, the Christians quote this as if it's one of Jesus' gospel. That's not what it says. Look what it says. In one, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets. You see that? As the prophets did it. Behold, I send my messenger or Rasul before thy face, which is a way of saying in front of you in Semitic language, which shall prepare thy way before thee. I'm sending you John the Baptist. And he's going to be before Jesus to prepare the way for Jesus, he says. Now watch. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. That's in case someone don't believe me when I say it's John the Baptist. Because when I ask John the Baptist, who was he? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. So that's John the Baptist we're talking about. Unless you want to find some new translation, which people do nowadays. <laughs> like the Restanded Version, Revised Version, Jehovah Witness Version, Seven Day Adventist Version, hey, but, uh, the Glorified Version. They're trying to, trying to change the version because they're going to try to change a simple meaning of the Gospel of Jesus. You can't. You can't. Now, we at number four. John, what did John do? John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of redemption for the remission of sins. Say, I told you it's for the removal of sins and to redeem yourself. And I say, you got me. Because I said it's not. You say, got you. I say, well now tell me why Jesus had to be baptized. Because he didn't need to have his sins removed. And if he was God, he didn't have to be redeemed. Tell me why he was baptized. Well, you say, he was baptized to be an example. That was John the Baptist's job. I just said that. <laughs> he was sent to prepare the way. But tell me why Jesus, God to some, the Son of God to others, had to be baptized. If this book teaches us what baptism is. Right? This book says baptism is for its own purpose. <laughs> Of the remission of sin and repentance. How can Jesus repent if he's never committed a sin? And how would Jesus have any sins removed that he never had? You understand what I mean? That's the question. 
when I ask Christian preachers that, and I've asked them, they give me that language called yum and yum. yum and yum. I said, I can tell you the answer, no, but I'm not unless you confess that you don't know and give up the clause. <laughs> Stop saying you're a preacher. Stop saying you're a reverend or pastor if you don't know the answer. Because I know the answer. I'll go on and watch what happens. Number five. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea. Everybody who lived in Judea came out to John the Baptist. And what happened? And they of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the whole place and Judea was the capital. You see? Watch what it says. And they went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem and were what? Somebody. What? You left out a very important word. They were all baptized <laughs> of him in the river of Jordan confessing their sins. So John the Baptist baptized everybody in Judea and all of Jerusalem. <laughs> they tried to make John the Baptist look like he was a little man with a little teeny congregation. They passed John the Baptist off. John the Baptist was a powerful man with a big salary who all wore sackcloth and ate locusts and went against the Lord of the Vicious. They didn't follow the Lord of the They were eating locusts and wearing clothes and ate. It's the wrong way to like the St. Peter and the Pharisees of the time were not wearing. He came and came and came with his own Lord and they met out in the wilderness near Jordan. Why did they eat near Jordan? Why in the wilderness? Because there was another group of men out there who called themselves the Essenes. You know about them? Well, the scientists found out because they found what they referred to as the Dead Sea Scrolls or the Tablets of Qumran found them up in the hall in our caves of the Jordan River. Do some research. That was John the Baptist congregation, the Essenes. Now do research on them and find out that they were mystics. And they had supernatural power, healing powers. They meditated most of the day. They bathed in big tubs of water. They fasted most of the time, 40 days and 40 nights of a time. <laughs> And they went into the wilderness to do this because they were close to God, as they say. The Christians don't have no knowledge of who these people are. They don't know. But they write in the Bible because they won't study past preachers' doctrines. And all the preachers are trying to do is keep gas in them Cadillacs. They don't care nothing about the truth of the Bible. If you're serious, when I say let's go to Greek, do you speak Greek? No. Do you speak Hebrew? No. You speak Aramaic? No. So you never really intended to know what Jesus was saying. You just want to know what King James said Jesus said. Because you really want to know, you all you're young enough where you would have took the time, Reverend, to learn the language of Christ. And then you would have opened your Bible in front of people and it would have been a Hebrew Bible. Let's go back to Mark again. So now we understand that John the Baptist had converted all of Jerusalem and Judea. All of them were converted and was now expecting the Messiah who they interpreted as the Christ. They all, they, I'm open to admit that they all said it. Number six. And John was clothed with camel's hair. That's the cloth. And with a girdle of skin about his loins. And he ate locusts and wild honey. They didn't have nothing to do with the law. <laughs> right? He's not following the law of Israel, not the books of Leviticus. Let's go on. And preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the laces of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and lose. He announced Jesus as being so much greater than himself that he said, With all the congregation I have, this, this one coming after me, I can't even match him to the point where I can get down and tie his shoes. Did he respect Jesus? <laughs> Did he love Jesus? You better believe he did. Now look how powerful he was. And now let's see what he says though. I indeed have baptized you with water. Submerging a person underwater. All the way underwater. Not in no church, holding your nose, dipping your back, and remember the Father, the Holy Ghost. Remember the Father. That's not the way it was done. And, and right here, John separates the way he was baptized from the way Jesus was baptized. 
He said, he baptizes with water. Now tell me what he said Jesus would do. You mean it. Huh? Say it again. But Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. They don't want the truth. They want to play. They want the tea off the truth. They don't want the R.E. The rest of the land. They just want the tea. We are born again. Believe me, the Almighty will protect you even what you don't know. He has. He'll forgive you for what you don't know. He's often given most merciful. He knows that. He knows that you're stumbling in the darkness. That's why I said, yea, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You're walking in shadows now. And death is in front of you. But... Fear no evil because he's with us. He's been protecting you for centuries. That's why we're here. You're coming down to the countdown of the end of the world. The world is the point now where every prophecy in the Bible is unfolded. You want pestilence? You want earthquakes? The world is lining itself up right now for a major earthquake in California. And they're calculating it. They say it's going to happen. They're telling people to get out of there. And they're still soul training. Number eight. I indeed have baptized with water. But he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. That's how Jesus will baptize with the Holy Ghost. Not with water. So take them tubs out the basements and them churches. If you're going to do it Jesus' way. <laughs> or admit that you're doing it John's way. And John's way was replaced by Jesus' way. You get the Holy Ghost walking down 42nd Street in the midst of all that devastment. The Holy Ghost can tap into you and you get to talking in tongues. <laughs> when I say tongues, I'll have you walking. I'll, I'll take you to books of Corinthians and explain tongues to you too. I ain't talking about no gibberish. It says tongues and translations. The word lisana means tongue for loga, language. And therefore, all of these followers of Jesus who were Jews, as they went out to different parts of the world, was able to speak to the people. That was the miracle. A very small miracle compared to some of the ones he performed, but that was one of the miracles. It says, And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John the Baptist. So Jesus himself was baptized. That's number nine. Number four tells us why people get baptized. For the remission of sin and redemption. So when you ask the Christian preacher, why did Jesus have to get baptized? He don't answer you. He just starts preaching. He says, see me, Reverend. I don't want to be disrespectful. But I'm just asking for an answer. I'm not asking for a sermon. Why was Jesus Christ who was born sinless, the incarnation of God in flesh. Why did he have to be baptized, is the question. I'm trying to give you questions to go out and ask them. When Reverend gets up there and starts preaching, say, excuse me, will there be a question and answer period after this lecture? I don't mind sitting to the lecture and getting this good feeling and singing and dancing and popping a tambourine, but will we have questions and answers? Will we walk through this Bible? Will we walk from west to east? Because I got some very important questions I want to ask you. But why'd you dip me in water if you baptized me in the name of Jesus? You should have dipped me in water and baptized me in the name of John. But dip me in the Holy Spirit and baptize me in the name of Jesus. <laughs> and if you can't dip me in the Holy Spirit, then you're the wrong reverend, so give up the throne. If you can't restore my spirit, then give up the throne. <laughs> you see? The millionaires aren't looking for Christ. They're looking for more millions. They're looking to control the world. And what do you think is going to happen to you when atheists rule the world? Huh? You got evangelists and Pentecostals and Jehovah's Witnesses and Muslims and everybody spreading out in different directions. And the enemy is the same. Atheists. You understand that? People who do not have love of the Heavenly Father. People who do not want to live by the laws and commandments of the scriptures. I don't care whether they're the Torah, the Talmud, the Mishnah, the Quran, the, the Injil, the Gospel. I don't care what it is, what path it's on. My father has there are many mansions. But you don't want to obey it. You want to make it obey you. You want to curve these scriptures and make them suit you. Like I just pointed out in St. Mark's. 
where it says that John said that he baptized with water in nine. But Jesus, one after him, is going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. Yet all the Christians are still dipping each other in water. Who are they following? John the Baptist or Jesus? It says the baptism is for the redemption and the remission of sin. To get your sins removed. Yet Jesus was baptized. And we call him sinless. Is this a mistake? Or is it a poor translation? A misunderstanding, or is it just an outright lie? In the book of John, when it says, "In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God," I would like to know if you can give me a better understanding than the King James Version interpretation of what that means. Saint John, chapter one, verse one: "In the beginning was the Kalima, not the Logos." It was no Greek. In the beginning was the Kalima, the word. Now here's the trick. The Kalima in Israel is this statement. Yo Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. That's what they call Shema Israel or El Kalimat. The declaration of the oneness of God is called the word in Hebrew teachings. If you ask them, if Jesus, that is Jesus, what is the highest of all of the commands? And he said that the Lord thy God is one God. He used that word. Now that word can be made flesh. How should that be? In the beginning was the declaration of the oneness of God. Why? Because when you write it down, you're going to see how it stretches from one word into a sentence. And then back into one word. They go, La ilaha illallah, in Arabic. It's the same thing in Hebrew, which comes from Allah. So every letter in that is one word. It pushes into the word, so that God was in the beginning, God was the beginning. The same was in the beginning with God. Now watch. And the word was with God. Now we have ma, with in a sense of accompanying, asahaba, to walk with and be with, and to have in my possession, you see the difference? And you have the word be with, by way of utilization in Semitic languages. In the scripture though, they use the word and, to have with me in my possession, with inside me, not outside of me, inside of me, here's what he said. In the beginning was that declaration of oneness, and the declaration of oneness was with God, within Him. Because He later put the declaration forward in the first commandment. He took it out of Himself and put it in the first commandment, because that's why He said it was written by God's own hand. He put the first commandment out, and that was that the Lord thy God is one God. That's four translations. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Because when God wrote the first commandment, who was he writing about? Himself. He wrote about the Lord thy God, and he was doing it himself. The word was with him, he was the word. He's the one who taught the declaration of oneness of God himself. About himself. This is not Jesus yet. He comes up in here, but not yet. Watch. The same was in the beginning with God. Which would have been, this is how it was. Man can he be died. And the, and the law. And this is how it was with God. This is how things were. He was alone. He was, in the beginning of Genesis, who was with him? It didn't say the Spirit of God and Jesus moved upon the face of the waters. It said the Spirit of God moved upon the surface of the waters. A single in the beginning, in Genesis 1. There's not no two there. And in Elohim, when it said Elohim, the Hebrew word Elohim is short. Ilo for Allah. It's the same word. Ilo and Allah is the same word. And him is just a plural. And that means Allah and all of his angelic hosts. The ones he used who was here before man was on earth. That's Elohim. The same was in the beginning with God. Now, all things were made by him. See, because we know all things wasn't made by Jesus. You see what I'm saying? But Satan wasn't made by Jesus. The tree in the garden wasn't made by Jesus. 
Because God takes exclusive right to those things in the beginning of the Bible. Himself in the first person singular. All things was made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. So nothing that came into existence would be other than by way of him. His column, his declaration, Allah or Elohim. In him was life. And the light was the light of man. See, Jesus was called the son of man. So therefore, as a son of man, he also had his light and his life. Why? Because in Genesis chapter 1, he said, I breathed into man of my spirit, and man became a living soul. The breath of life was light of every man that cometh into the world. The light is the light in man. Watch what it says. What is this life and light? The light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness precedes not. The Spirit of the Most High is inside of every one of your dark shells. Your, I don't mean your skin, I mean your, your body without the light of the Lord is dark. But you don't feel the presence of God there. But in Genesis, what did he say? He said he put his Spirit into you and you became a living soul. Is that what he said? So he's there in you, but you don't know it until you get the Holy Ghost. So the light is shining in the darkness, but you don't even perceive his presence. Jesus is not shining inside you. Jesus didn't even say he would shine inside you. He said he'd send the Holy Spirit to be in you. So this can't be him. Number six. There was a man sent. They just took the word sent because the word would be Rasul, an apostle. And they just translated it wrong. There was a man who was an apostle from God, Rasul Allah. See? Then they give you his name, whose name was Yahya, or Yohanna in Hebrew, John. The same, this man John, came for a witness. Now we're back to the statement of Revelation chapter 1. A witness. See the same words? Came for a witness. To bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. They say, see, the him here they say is Jesus. No. He came, John, to bear witness of the light from, from the Father that through him men may believe. Why? Because John was the one baptizing people with the light. The Spirit. He made them. He converted all of Jerusalem and Judea before Jesus started teaching. Right in the books of Mark, chapter 1, the whole of Judea and Jerusalem did John convert to repent of their sins, it says. So John received this book in the year 96 A.D. You want to accept the teachings the way you want. You don't want the pure, unadulterated, Judaic teachings of Jesus where you have to keep the Sabbath, circumcision, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. You don't want that part of it. You don't want to fast. You want to limit and say, well, no, we don't have to do that nowadays. And we don't have to do this nowadays. And we don't have to do that nowadays. We don't have to do that nowadays. What do you do that Christ did? You didn't knock off everything he did. When you look at y'all, you don't see nothing he did. What do y'all do that Christ did? He didn't go out spreading the gospel the way you do. What are you doing that Christ did? Nothing but saying you do. We will return with the true light after this brief intermission. Now is the time to ask questions of your leaders, teachers, and preachers. Where did all the races of people come from? Why did John have to baptize Jesus at the Jordan? And why do the four Gospels contradict each other? The answer to these questions can be with only one man, as Sa'id and Imam Isa al-Hadi and Mahdi, the man who has written over 150 books on such topics as, Is There Life on Other Planets? How Were the Pyramids Built? What race was Adam and Eve? And was the Holy Quran made up by Muhammad, or was it a divine scripture sent from the Most High? And what is the difference between the spirit and the soul? The answer to these questions can be found in the most dynamic books in history, authored by as Sa'id al-Imam Isa al-Hadi and Mahdi. These books can be purchased at the original tent at 719 Bushwick Avenue, Brooklyn, New York, 11221. Would you like to see the man behind the voice you hear teaching the total truth? He is there at the Hall of Knowledge, located at 548 Hart Street, Brooklyn, New York. Every Saturday and Sunday at 1 p.m., the Nubian Islamic Hebrews would like to invite you to question and answer classes with as Sayyid Ali Imam Isa al-Hadi al-Mahdi. Come listen and learn. Hear the words of truth for yourself. Hear the answers to long-awaited questions. 
also for your spiritual growth, an intricate design woven prayer rug designed by the hand of Sayyid Ali Mamisal Hadi Mahdi. Also available are prayer beads, incense, and oils. If you would like any further information on these items, contact the original tents of Kidar, 719 Bushwick Avenue, Brooklyn, New York, 11221. And be sure to ask for a listing of the most dynamic books in history, authored by Sayyid Ali Mamisal Hadi Mahdi. Now let us continue with the true light. Remember, you are the light, and you have the power over all things. Genesis 25, verse 24. Is this speaking on the um, Amorites and the Nubians when Rebecca gave birth and first came out all over like a hairy garment, and they called this name What's his name? Esau. Esau. Is that? No. What happened is, these are twins. See, the Christians try to make it look like these are not twins. These are twins, and that is a very common occurrence. You have people with uh, give birth, and a baby has a lot of hair, mm-hmm. born with hair on the body. A lot of people are born like that. A lot of black people won't admit it, but if they ask their grandmother, they say, yeah, when you was born, you was covered in hair. Nah. And then as you got older, that hair went away. When these two twins were born, one of them was born full of hair, and one of them was born very weak and spottish, red, with red spots on it. Jacob was born with these red spots on him, like certain babies are born with red bruise marks and they go away. And Esau was born covered in hair. So Esau's name meant hairy. That's what the name Esau means. Because when the priests looked at them, they named the child after that, what they saw. And they called him Esau or Yitzor in Hebrew, or Is in Arabic, and it meant hairy. So these were both twins and they were the same complexion. Go ahead. Let me just ask you this. Both of them were, they were both Nubians. Both of them were black, that's right. Okay, now I was in the city. I don't know what they were. They were saying that um, one of them were white and the other one was black. Yeah, they called themselves Israelites. They came here one time. He was saying that um, the one who sold his birthright, which one was it, Jacob? Jacob was black and Esau was white, they say. Okay. Yeah, it has no truth in it whatsoever. Because, let me tell you why. Let's go back and find out who we're talking about. We're talking about Jacob and Esau who were born to Isaac and Rebekah. Right? Exactly. Now, Rebekah was the daughter of a man named Nahar who was Abraham's uncle. Which meant that he was Abraham's father's brother. Alright? Now, Abraham was a Chaldean and they're known, to, they, everybody knows the ancient Chaldeans was black, they got statues of them because they lived in the land of Babylon, but they'll show you with the nappy beards and the nappy hair, okay? If he married his own father's brother, then he married his what? His cousin, his first cousin, right? So Rebecca was really Isaac's first cousin. So therefore, Rebecca and both Isaac had to be what color? Black. They both, so therefore Rebecca was black and Isaac was black and then Rebecca and Isaac got together and gave birth to twins and they were called Jacob and Esau. So now, two black grandparents on both sides and two black great grandparents on both sides and two black great great grandparents on both sides mean all four generations was black gene, there was no white in there. Tell them Israelites on 42nd Street to please tell me how four generations of black genes gave birth to one white kid. Okay, I don't, I don't doubt that they were I know, black. I know, I, know, I, know you, I know you saw it through it. It's, just, it's, just a good, it's good to ask the question. But they just don't no. know what they're talking about. They're trying to find out where the white man fits in the Bible, and they right. don't know. Okay, but it was also explained how, where it says, don't quote me on this, it says, that the young will rule over the old until the yoke is broken. That's right. Okay. And that's exactly what happened. They were saying how the white man is the younger, is the younger race of this earth. That he is ruling over the, the old, which is the black race. And until we break the yoke, then we'll take our rightful position. That's a nice little story. Just is not true. <laughs> it comes out where what happened is the tribe of Israel, because Jacob had his name changed to Israel. Right? And he went and moved into the land of his uncle, another uncle, Leban, and took two wives, Rachel and Leah, who were his daughters, and then their two servants, and gave birth to the twelve tribes of Israel, and got many flocks and sheep, 
while living in there through seven periods of seven, seven which were fourteen, two sets of seven years, and became very powerful. And Esau sought him out and met him in the wilderness. You follow that? And Jacob bore witness to Esau. So Jacob the younger had become greater and more powerful than the elder brother Esau who sold his birthright for a little bowl of beans or pottage as they called it. And now what has happened is Israel fell into oblivion and Esau married into the Edomite race. It says that he married a Hittite and he later became known as Edom on Mount Seir. The word Edom in Hebrew means to become red. So the Edomite race or the Oriental race came out of that brother Esau from mixing their blood where Jacob's family broke the covenant and fell into subjection. They fell out of grace of the Most High. You see that? Whereas the Oriental race came to power. Now the whole world is depending on the Oriental race for everything. From cars to cigarette lighters to televisions to everything. You follow what happened? That's what they meant in there. And that's a prophecy that has fulfilled itself today. That Japan and Korea are now more powerful than Israel. And all the Israelites which are you. Now you who are the younger Jacob, you're now serving them. You depend on them for everything. But there was a time when they served you. When Esau was depending on Jacob for support. When the Edomites depended on the Israelites to bail them out in a battle against the Amalekites. Okay, awesome. Is it wrong for the five percent to say that they are God? Yes, because they don't know why they're saying it. So, oh. See, in this country, you can put a badge on in a blue suit. But you they, follow that? And they, say you're a cop and then get arrested for impersonation. Exactly. Now, first of all, if they're speaking in numbers, they are not 5% of the population of the world. Because they say 5% of the population. If they do not make up 5% of the world, all right, that part of it can't be true. They're not poor righteous teachers who do not believe in the teaching of the 10% because the teaching of the 10%, which they refer to as preachers and teachers, they teach from the Bible. Correct? And the 5 percenters teach from the Bible. They say that he got his message on the Isles of Patmos, which comes out of the Bible. That's in the lessons. So they do believe in the teachings of the 10%. They say they don't believe in a spook God. Correct? They say. However, Clarence 13X, who they call Allah, is not in the body anymore, walking around on 126 feet of Manhattan anymore. So now, what do they believe in? They got a picture of him, and if he's not in the flesh, any new 5% who never saw him in the flesh is believing in much as a spook as anybody else. Because he is a spook to anybody who has not seen him in the flesh. I don't care what they say, if they never saw him, like I said, the nation of Islam. I don't, if you never saw Master Farad Muhammad yourself, then you believe in a spook God just like the Christians who say that they never saw Jesus. They have pictures of him, but they never saw him. But Jesus said, you can get to heaven without seeing me, just believe on my name. But the nation of Islam said everything is for real, and Master Prophet Muhammad is for real, and God ain't no spook, etc., etc. And I say, where's he at? They say, he left in 1933. Well, have you seen him? No. Oh, man, you believe in a spook just like anybody else. And if you walk up to a 5%, they say, well, where's your leader? Clarence 13X, his name is. Where's he at? He got shot. You mean he's dead? Well, he lives on. Oh, well, take me to him. I want to talk to him. Uh, you can't do that. Then you believe in a spook too, then. You can't get away from that. <laughs> and you believe in the spook. Why do you used to call me a spook all the time? What he was trying to say when he called me and you spooks is that we are people of soul. That we have soul. Why? Because in Genesis, God, as they call him, says, I breathe into man of my spirit and man does what? What did he become? A living soul. That's what Genesis 1 says, right? I breathe into man of the breath of life and man became a living soul. You see that? Yes, I am a spook. So I am a soul, but I believe in the supreme creator of the boundless universe who I find manifested through me and you as a breath of life. Um, I was flipping through the lessons a little while back and I ran across some questions. And I was hoping it, it would be, you know, explained to me. Like, I was also listening to this tape. It's about who made the Holy Quran or Bible, how long ago and will you tell us? Why does Islam renew its history every 25,000 years? 
Now you're saying that um, the scientists renewed their history or Quran every tw 25,000 years. I was wondering if you could explain it to me. Actually, what you did was you pulled out part of the answer. The question is, who wrote the Holy Quran or Bible and tell us when it expires? Holy Quran was by the original man of Allah, supreme being the black man of Asia. Holy Quran expires every 25,000 years, 9,080 days from this date, written in the nation of Islam, does everything all wise, right, and exact. Then it goes on to compare 24,896,000 miles to the circumference of the planet Earth and says that we're given one land, which is one mile per year. You understand what I'm saying? So what okay. they were trying to say that every time that the Holy Quran covers the whole world, cycles the whole planet, then it's time for its re renewal. All right? When Islam left the East and circled the whole world, the last place it arrived was here in the West, in North America. You see, that's why the Honorable Elijah Muhammad told them to look for somebody bearing a book with the lamb on it. A man is going to come and give him a better explanation of the Holy Quran. Because at the point of our coming into existence, that is the time for the Quran and the history of Islam to renew itself. The word renew is to reform or to be a reformer or a mujiddin. He was telling them the next time the Holy Quran is reformed, look for a man and you'll see him and he'll be bearing a book, the Lamb. And he'll be the first black man to translate the Holy Quran and make it understandable to you. And that's our job. We gave birth to the Holy Quran and cycled the whole world. And the last place it came was to America, to you. You see? And I'm that reformer sent with that ability, with the Book of Lamb, to translate the Quran and give you an, a renewed understanding of Islam. Takes you back through the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and back before that, all the way back to Adam and to the end of the world. And that's what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad told people to look for. The person would have that ability that would be able to cycle the whole world. And then yes. 24,896,000 miles, that Quran traveled to India, it traveled to China, it went to Alaska, it's in Russia. The last place people got the Holy Quran was here in the wilderness of North America. And he didn't try to teach the Quran because he know he couldn't. He told you someone after him was going to come with that. You see, there's a difference between teaching the Quran and teaching the Quran. When you teach it in all English, it's Quran. When you teach it from the Arabic, it's Quran. And all these teachers in the world, here in the Western world, are not teaching y'all the Holy Quran. They're teaching y'all the book, the Quran. <laughs> okay. That's what he meant by the 25,000 years. Holy Quran would, says, it says, who wrote the Holy Quran or Bible? And he referred to it as a Bible, meaning a little book, a scripture, biblical. Who wrote the Holy Quran or Bible? Tell us, tell us when it is expired, meaning the nation of Islam. The Holy Quran expires every 25,000 years, 9,080 days from this date written. The nation of Islam, when that happens, the nation of Islam then will be doing things all wise, right, and exact. Because during the period of time of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, they wasn't doing everything all wise, right, and exact. Because they wasn't dressing the way he put them on the front of the newspaper. I think the brothers should have the newspapers there now. And he'll show you the symbol of them. They wasn't dressing the way, but he showed you this man, and he said, there's a picture of one of them, and he shows a picture of a man standing on a jellabia, and says, all eyes shall behold him. All right? But that quote that he refers to, when he says, all eyes shall behold him, is in the Bible, and the next step is, the son of man. The one who comes out of the east to the west. And you see how he got him dressed there. He has him dressed like that brother standing up in front of you is dressing. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad throughout his papers was telling people to get ready. He showed them a link on the front of the cover where they show us shaking hands with them. They're showing you the, the link between them coming from them over to us. He has another article in the paper where they show you actually his followers leaving him and walking over a bridge where they're meeting people in white turbans. There's a little small picture on another paper you have over there. So all of this was Honorable Elijah Muhammad telling those people where to go and who to go to and what to look for and what knowledge, wisdom, and understanding he would have. Because they were not doing things all wise, right, and exact. Because the Honorable Elijah Muhammad made the statement, can a Muslim be fooled? What's the answer? No. No, not, not, nowadays. Nowadays. not nowadays. He left part of it out again. He got to stop doing that. He <laughs> said, so, no, not nowadays. But what happened is, when Wurf D came to the throne, didn't he fool everybody? Huh? Have, no, he let everybody. the devil in the nation of Islam, didn't he? True. And that's not the teaching of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, because what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad say about the reformation of the devil? Can, Can the devil be reformed? No. No, they tried. <laughs> and they found out it could not be done. You understand what I'm trying to say? So they were not all wise, right, and exact. However, when you walk up on an Ansar who is following these books to the letter, who are following the doctrine that's being passed to them, you can't find fault in his doctrine. Out of the, the two-edged tongue that comes out of his mouth, you can't stop him. Everybody that comes against an answer, whether he's a beginner like you are, or been here years, you got so many answers, you, and you can always rest assured, you say, if I don't have the answer, I'll be back with it, because I know who got it. There's a guy who got a book with a lamb on it, and he got all the light that we need in that book. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. That's, that's what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was telling about for the 25,000 years, and the renewal of the Holy Quran. The renewal of the Holy Quran meant the real, proper translation, a revised, a renew. The word renew in Arabic is mujidda, the reformer. 
Okay. So are all white people the devil? All that are born and those not yet born are the devil. <laughs> Always will be, always was, and you cannot well, reform a devil. You're absolutely right. So therefore, <laughs> so therefore, <laughs> I want you go ahead. Is it wrong? Okay, being that we are, so is is the devil children of God also? Now, when you get down to the essence of it, the angels were created by Allah also. You understand that? Angels were created by And the original angels are supernatural beings, as they have it, for lack of a better word in English. All right? Malaika. Mm -hmm. Okay? They are all from Allah. And don't forget that that angel that you call Lucifer and the devil at one time was in heaven. Right? And was one of the highest of all the angels. Did you know that? Yes, I knew that. All right, so now this guy we're calling the devil, the reason why he's so smart and so tricky and so sticky and so slimy like the scripture tells because he came down to earth with the knowledge he had in heaven. You understand that? Okay. And that's why the white man is so tricky. So when you look at it and say, is the devil a child of God? You say in his original form he was, but now that he has transformed himself into the serpent and a beast with a curse, he can't be cursed and be of God. You okay. follow? Perfectly well. So let me ask you this. Can you call yourself righteous and hate the devil? But, but... No, you can't. No, you can't. No, you can't. I mm. fool you, huh? <laughs> I don't hate the devil. I don't hate the devil no more than I don't hate a lion. But I'm not going to get inside a lion's cage. I don't hate him, but you won't see me climbing inside there and shaking his hand and becoming a sandwich. And I know the devil is like a lion. A roaring lion. Perfectly well. Huh? I said, you're, you're absolutely right. I couldn't agree with you more. I don't hate him. I just <laughs> avoid him. I don't need him. Okay. If we get together, all you people here, if we start working together, we can do it. But our problem is, the white man taught y'all how to be individuals. I go for mine. We got Ivis. I got mine. <laughs> you got yours? I got mine. I look. You go to a party with your best friend, and you're trying to outdress your best friend. You're checking out. You call on the phone and say, well, what you going to have on tonight? She says, oh, I got this new outfit. You go, oh, gosh, you got something new. But she says, why well, you know them green shoes? You say, yeah, and you check that off. You know that, that green dress? She goes, yeah, I remember that one. You know what I mean? So she ain't going to look. I got, okay, good. Now, I'm going to put on my new dress. I can come out here and look better than her. That's how we are. Is that not true? Our own friends, we try to outdress. Try to outdance each other. Try to get a better record player. Try to get a better looking car. Always talking about, I got this, I got that. Instead of us coming together and y'all say, listen, let's pool our money together and buy a couple of outfits, we basically the same size, and we can interchange clothes. You know what I'm saying? Or we can, you use my car and I use your car, let's chip in and just get a better car and we both can share it. Black people, we've got to learn to do that. We've got to come together, pool our efforts, our strength, our finance, and build our own nation. The Chinese did it, it's called Chinatown. The Italians did it, it's called Little Italy. The Jews do it, it's called Jewtown. Where's yours? Harlem? No, it ain't. Because they came back into Harlem and took all the buildings. They're buying them right from under you. They're remodeling them. That's how we are. Is that not true? Our own friends we try to outdress. Try to outdance each other. Try to get a better record player. Try to get a better looking car. Always talking about, I got this, I got that. Instead of us coming together and y'all say, listen, let's pool our money together and buy a couple of outfits, we basically the same size, and we can interchange clothes. You know what I'm saying? Or we can, you use my car and I use your car, let's chip in and just get a better car and we both can share it. Black people, we've got to learn to do that. We've got to come together, pool our efforts, our strength, our finance, and build our own nation. The Chinese did it, it's called Chinatown. The Italians did it, it's called Little Italy. The Jews do it, it's called Jewtown. Where's yours? Harlem? No, it ain't. Because they didn't, came back into Harlem and took all the buildings. They're buying them right from under you. They're remodeling the Bronx, then they're going to put you out. They tore down Broadway, they're rebuilding Broadway, and they're not renting it back to the Negroes or the Puerto Ricans. It's for him. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, what does it say?
No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve Allah and mammon. And then it goes on. See, most people stop right there. And they'll never know what that quote is talking about. It's talking about working, having a job, trying to set up a career, trying to pay them back bills and using that as an excuse. The Bible goes right on to tell you what it's talking about. What does it say? Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. That's what Jesus said. Don't take no thought about your life. What does he say after that? What ye? What ye shall eat. Or That's what the question asked drink. What do y'all eat? We eat food. <laughs> the Lord tells us, don't be talking about what you're going to eat. What else he says? Or? Or what you're going to drink. Don't worry about what you're going to drink or? Or? Mm, nor you, what? Nor, nor yet. yet for your body. Go what, ahead. What you shall put on. Now, not, where do y'all get your clothes from? It's obvious. We wear a lot of... We, I got more material on than you got on. I walk around with maybe 10 yards of white fabric on every day. I mean, I'm saying, you understand? Go ahead. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold. Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap. <laughs> no fowls, you don't see no birds out there pushing no plow, digging up no soil, and planting no seeds, but they do reap. They eat. Because who take, oh, go ahead, let's see what the Bible says. Nor gather into bonds, yet the Heavenly Father feedeth them. Are who you takes not? care of them? The Heavenly Father. Where is your faith? You don't believe. You're like, I don't know how they live, man. I'm not going in there. One of my friends said, y'all might just collapse. Well, if we collapse, Jack, we're going to collapse together. But at least we tried. We tried to change the path that the white man has planned for our people, which is nothing but self-destruction. At least we're trying. At least for one thing, my children is not going to be exposed to crack. At least we got the step one down. We're on our way to setting up. We speak our own language. We have our own culture. We have our own flag. At least we got some type of identity and it's yours. Don't wait till we finish it and then say, I'm going to join when it's all done. I still got two more buildings to paint. When they finish painting them two, I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't nobody in the whole world like me and you. No people on the whole planet has went through what you went through. And nobody can survive the way you do and still be sitting up there laughing at ourselves. Nobody could do it. Be proud of yourselves because you're a strong nation of people. But you're a stubborn nation of people. You're a hard-headed nation of people. But we are a great people. And the only thing that's holding us back right now is ourselves. Because the man is so caught up in his own problems, he got so many world problems, we got time to get it together. Because he doesn't have his attention on me and you right now. So we better get ours. We ain't got that much time before he turns his attention back on us. We better get together and we better start doing something now so that we're strong enough that he doesn't bother. Black people, you got a chance to make it. They get y'all locked up inside them projects and close those doors. Ain't no fire escape. Either you niggas gonna have to fly <laughs> or y'all gonna be inside concentration camps. And you sisters are working that telephone company now where they don't have no windows. They trying to tell you something. They built all these buildings throughout the ghetto and call them revised telephone company buildings with no windows. Those are concentration camps for you. And don't think they don't do it because they did it to the Japanese. You understand what I'm trying to say? That may sound funny, but we are a great people. We have a great opportunity right now to do something. Don't blow it. And we're going to spread this good news throughout the world. We're translating the books now into Spanish and into French and into Arabic. We're going to spread it out. Because ain't nobody can beat the words of our doctrine. So all the Sunni Muslims and everybody that talks about us says, I don't like him because he's Dr. York. You know, he's a singer. Well, I don't like, they got all it, but they don't never, what about the books? I, I, I don't, well, they keep jumping off the book. <laughs> so what about what he says in that book? Yeah, but uh, you know, you heard he's a singer, right? Well, I ain't actually about that. What about the books he wrote? They can't even deal with the doctrine. All they can deal with is the person. And the person ain't worth concentrating on. It's the books, the doctrine that the man is putting out. Don't worry about Dr. York or Imam Isa. They're just people. You better worry about the truth that the man is putting out. You understand what I'm saying? Don't waste the time. 
Because we're going to move on without you anyway, I'm telling you. <laughs> Whether you're here or not, we're still moving. Because some of y'all have been coming for years, and you still see us getting bigger and bigger. And you sit home and say, you know what? You say to your wife, you know, uh, I'm really thinking about get, becoming a part of the community. I really see what they're doing. I, I don't agree with everything, but I can relate. I see what they're trying to do. And then you've been saying that for five years. What are you waiting for? Go on. Read this section, because it talks more about you. And the body... And We're still in Matthew chapter 6, right? Right. Go ahead. The latter part of 25, verse. And the bodies in raiment. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into bonds. Yet their heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? With all that y'all think about yourself, what can you add to yourself anyway? Can you change time or destiny? Can you make yourself an inch taller or shorter? Go ahead. And why take ye thought for, <clears throat> for raiment? For raiment. Consider, Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. They're provided by the Heavenly Father. Go ahead. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Solomon was considered one of the richest men in the world, second to Ramses the second of Egypt. One of the richest men in all the world, and all that he had, he didn't look as good as one bushel of flowers. <laughs> That's what he's saying. One bushel of flowers that the Almighty created. Go ahead. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe ye, O ye of little faith? See what he said about you? <laughs> At the end of the day, he said he, he clothed all the flowers. And he clothed them and let them come in in the summer and go out in the winter and reclothe them <clears> each year. Isn't he going to take care of you? Aren't you more important than them? What did he call you? What did Jesus call you? O ye of little faith. O ye of little faith. Don't you have any faith in your heavenly Father? Go on. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or, or what shall we drink? Or, or wherewith shall we be clothed? For, for after all these things do the Gentiles seek. That's right. Keep going. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye shall need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of Allah and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Now you see how he dealt with you? And what did he compare you to? He compared you to a Gentile. Right? And if you go to the book of Revelation, where they're telling us about preparing ourselves for the kingdom of heaven, which he said right there is for you in Matthew 6. In Revelation chapter 11, he starts to tell you about the temple <clears throat> and those that worship or prostrate therein. Because they use the word prostrate in the Hebrew and Arabic. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, which is Allah, and the altar of them that worship therein. But, now that's those inside this tabernacle of the Most High. Now let me talk to y'all who are outside the tabernacle but still say you're with us. What does it say? But, somebody read it. But, the court which is without the temple, leave it out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. You see how he did that? He said, those who are out are still giving themselves unto the Gentiles. That's the Bible. The Quran will back it up in the second chapter, when it says there are some of those who say we have faith, in the law on the last day, but they're not in with the faithful. Be mu'mineen. They're not in with them. They say I do. They say I'm with y'all. They say I believe everything y'all believe. I read the books. I follow. I know one from Abraham. I know who the Amorite is. I know who the devil is. But they don't come in. They stay outside and say it. <laughs> خلق الإنسان من علق اقرأ وربك الأكرم 
الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم صدق الله العظيم Those are verses 1 through 5 of Surat Al-Alaq from the Holy Quran chapter Separation of Cells. Now the 96, originally the first chapter revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. Translation by As-Sayyid Imam Isa al-Hadi al-Mahdi. And it reads as follows. Begin all things with the illustrious names of Allah, the yield of the most merciful. O seal of the prophets of Allah, Muhammad, by the supreme sovereignty of your sustainer creator. You are being ordered to read by beginning with the name of your illustrious sustainer who created all things. He, Allah, created all human beings of a separating cell. So read because your sustainer, Allah, is most generous. He uses the quill to teach. He, Allah, taught human beings what they would have never known. You have been listening to The True Light with As-Sayyid Al-Imam Isa al-Hadi al-Mahdi. The Nubian Islamic Hebrew Mission would like you to write or send questions to True Light, 719 Bushwick Avenue, Brooklyn, New York, 11221.